So, ensuring equity is a goal for all of us who serve students. I'm honored to int introduce our next speaker, Dr. Frank Harris III. Dr. Harris and Dr. Luke Wood founded the Community College Equity Assessment Lab, a national research and practice lab that partners with community colleges to support their capacity in advancing outcomes for students who have been historically underserved in education, particularly students of color. Today, his topic is creating a culturally affirming experience in the classroom. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Harris. Always a pleasure to visit the Central Valley. Thank you for having me. I hear, hear the weather's down to the low 90s, so I like to think that I brought some good weather with me here from San Diego, right? Um, but uh, first and foremost, I want to start by thanking uh, Dr. Carol Goldsmith for her leadership and for inviting me to be with you today. Um, I also want to acknowledge Trustee Johnson and any other trustee that has joined us today. Thank you for your, your leadership and your advocacy for students. Um, and for this, this, this wonderful district. And then, uh, of course, I have to I'd be remiss if I did not acknowledge the four college presidents in the district, Clovis President Dr. Kim Armstrong, Fresno City President Dr. Robert Pimentel, Madera President Dr. Angel Reyna, and uh, last but not least, an SDSU alum, Reedley President Dr. Jerry Buckley. Thank you. So as you all, you can see I have five, I literally have five jobs at my home institution at SDSU, but most of the insights that I'll share with you today comes from the work that I've done over the past 12 years as co-director of the Community College Equity Assessment Lab. And through my work at SEAL, I've had the opportunity to learn from students and colleagues about what does it really take to advance equity and student success, starting with creating safe and welcoming and inclusive environments that are conducive to student success, and to building the capacity of all educators to serve students equitably and responsibly. And so uh, that said, there's gonna be two objectives that inform our discussion today. Uh, I'm gonna spend some time unpacking some events that have happened over the past three years that have had an impact on uh, higher education and you know, for, for the past three years and in the foreseeable future. And then um, lastly, I'm gonna spend most of my time Unpacking, um, unpacking several strategies that I've put together. So 10 strategies I'm gonna share with you that I think are gonna be very important as we think about what it is we need to do to continue advancing equity and student success. And so uh, I wanna begin by sharing, I think we are all very keenly aware of how COVID-19 not only changed higher education seemingly overnight, but it also had a profound impact on the entire world. And so many people lost loved ones, some lost their employment, businesses, and their homes, to name a few. And we also know that COVID has had a deleterious effect on our health and wellness, both physical and mental. And many of our students and colleagues are still struggling uh, with anxiety and other health-related consequences from the pandemic. And because we also know that disproportionately impacted communities were amongst hit the, the most hardest hit by the pandemic, students, um, who are disproportionately impacted in education are overrepresented among those who left community colleges and have not re-enrolled because of the pandemic. And shortly after the pandemic, um, we witnessed the tragic murders of George Floyd and Ahmaud Aubrey, and we learned of the death of Breonna Taylor, and uh, there were many others, far too many to name. And this sparked national protests and calls for accountability across the world colleges and universities and businesses and other organizations uh, across the country release statements of solidarity and promise to do more to address systemic racism in their institutions and to do right by people of color. And of course, today we have the hindsight, the benefit of hindsight, and it has shown us that these were empty promises in many cases. And now we find ourselves immersed in a context in which race relations appears to be more strained than they have been since the Civil Rights Movement. And we've also experienced record rates of inflation over the past three years. In the year 2020, the rate of inflation was about 1.4%, 1 
it rose to a 7% in 2021 and decreased slightly to 6.5% in 2022 and now stands at about 5% in 2023. And record inflation has been directly attributed to a huge spike in the cost of living, where food and clothing and shelter and healthcare and transportation and other essential basic needs have become far too expensive for many Americans to afford. And in a place like California, where the cost of living is already incredibly high, the impact of inflation is experienced more intensely here than in other parts of the country. Now, of course, we also know that this means the cost of enrolling in college has become far too high for students who perhaps have the most to gain from it. So even with financial aid, like the California Promise Grant and other supports that um, the prospect of working less to attend school while the cost of living continues to rise is a sacrifice that far too many cannot afford to make. And it has not been helpful, it has not been helpful that some of us have found it important, uh, that some have found it important to launch vicious attacks on higher education by questioning the value and the worth of a college degree and suggesting that college is not necessary to gain meaningful employment and it, that pays a livable wage. And of course we know, being higher education professionals, that a college degree or certificate is absolutely essential in being able to compete and uh, make it into competitive industries and markets. And then we also know that these same folks have also attacked diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts, as well as ethnic studies and critical race theory, claiming that these efforts in areas of study should not be supported or taught. And then finally, we all know that the Supreme Court has made some recent rulings that have gutted reproductive rights, have made it legal to discriminate against the LGBTQ population on the basis of religion, and have rendered race-conscious admissions unconstitutional. They also rejected the Biden administration's loan forgiveness program, which many students and families, perhaps even some of us in this room today, were counting on for much needed financial relief. And all of these issues, all of these issues have a direct and negative impact on our enrollment, student success, mental health and wellness, and campus climate. And so, um, along the same lines, when we do a quick scan of the four colleges in the district's student equity plans, it helps to reveal how disproportionate impact shows up in the state center community college district. We see significant uh, disproportionate impact on student enrollment, persistence, completion, and transfer in some cases. And what you see here are the groups that have identified as dis being disproportionately impacted on each indicator in the four, college equity, four colleges' equity plans. Across the five indicators and the four colleges, Hispanic students, the district's largest racial ethnic group, shows up 14 times. Black students show up 16 times. Male students of any race also show up 16 times as well. And clearly, we have very important work to do if we're going to achieve our goal of eliminating equity gaps and disproportionate impact. And in order to do so, all educators, everyone in this room must bring a def, must bring, cannot, this cannot be achieved if educators bring deficit mindsets or perspectives about disproportionately impacted students into their educational practice. Instead, to achieve equity and student success, we all must approach the work from an equity-minded and an institutional responsibility perspective. Of course, we know the concept of equity-mindedness was developed by Dr. Estella Bensimone, an education researcher and advocate whose work has played an essential role in guiding educational policies that are aligned with and advance equity. According to Dr. Bensimone, equity-mindedness is comprised of five core principles that educators must embrace to ensure equity, that being evidence-based, and that equity-minded educators uh, use disaggregated data in order to reveal hidden patterns of inequity and use the data to guide their sense-making and action. Equity-minded educators are also race-conscious and that they acknowledge that educational opportunity in the United States is heavily stratified on the basis of race, with students and communities of color having less access to higher education and the resources that are necessary to succeed within it. 
They also see students' racial identities and experiences as key sources of knowledge and assets that can be leveraged to facilitate their learning and their success. Equity-minded educators are also institutionally focused in that they demand institutional accountability for student success and believe that student success is determined by what institutions, institutions do to meet students' learning needs rather than exclusively on students' efforts as it's often assumed. They're also systematically aware. They recognize that inequity is a systemic problem that is reflected in nearly every social institution that is designed to serve students and communities including our K-12 system, our healthcare system, our workforce, our justice system, uh, and, our, and the justice system, the name some. And these systems have a long history of disproportionate impact when it comes to serving priority students and communities. And then finally, equity-minded educators are equity advancing. They are committed to advancing equity in every educational space in which they find themselves. They bring an equity-minded perspective to their classrooms, the student services work, the committees they serve on, and their community work, and in every other aspect of their roles as educators. And now, what I would like to do is use the remainder of my time to share 10 strategies that we can all employ to center equity, critical co uh, cultural competence, and cultural relevancy into the teaching and learning experiences that we oversee. And while most of my focus here will be primarily on what occurs in the context of instruction, everything that I share um, can be easily applied to serving students outside of the classroom. Collectively, the goals of these strategies will be to challenge students to maximize their potential while conveying high expectations of them, supporting students in meeting these expectations, and while consistently communicating authentic care for their well-being and their success. All of the strategies come from the work that my colleagues and I in the, the Community College Equity Assessment Lab have been doing in collaborations with districts much like the State Center Community College District and colleges like Clovis and Fresno and Madera and Reedley for more than a decade. First strategy, we must be intrusive. Being intrusive essentially means that we take proactive steps to support students. When we're intrusive, we do not wait for students to ask for help or invite us to support them. Instead, we take a proactive approach to doing so. Remember, seeing students' performance as an indicator of our effectiveness as educators is a central aspect of equity-mindedness. Thus, we need to ask ourselves, what information and resources will students need in order to be successful? And in response, we need to make sure students have access to this information and the resources before they actually need them. We also need to model approaches to the courses, to the course that will lead to their success. For example, note-taking is one of the most important skills we can have as learners. However, we all know that there are literally hundreds of different ways to take notes, and some note-taking so, note strategies work better in some courses than they do in other courses. And finally, I also suggest that you take some time early in the course to demonstrate to students how to take notes for, them, how to take notes for your classes, Provide and provide them examples. You can do the same things for course readings and preparing study guides for the course. The key point here is to not leave students guessing and wondering what would they need to do to be successful. Next, we must be relational. Authentic relationships between students and faculty that are grounded in trust and mutual respect and authentic care are the foundations of student success. We have learned from our work that these relationships are far more likely to be established when the educator takes on the responsibility of creating co the conditions for them to emerge. And as educators, we can all attest to the transformational impact that relationships can have on a student's trajectory. Now, unfortunately, disproportionately impacted students rarely enjoy relationships with educators that have a positive impact on their experiences and their success. And when we ask students of color, for example, to describe the relationships they have with, with educators, we're often met with a look, looks of confusion and bewilderment, and are, which are followed by statements like, there is no relationship, or I don't have one, or my professors are really not interested in having a relationship with me. I just go to class and leave as soon as it's done. 
And now I can understand that it can be incredibly challenging to build relationships with every student you teach, especially with, when we're teaching online like we've all been, done, been doing for the better part of the past three years. However, it is important that we do what we can to create a sense of community in our courses. And we can start that by humanizing ourselves. Maybe record a short video that can be viewed at the beginning of class to let students know who you are, where you come from, and what do we love most about teaching at Clovis or Fresno or Madeira or Reedley. And we can also share other relevant details about ourselves, like our personal hobbies, our favorite books, movies, activities we enjoy doing with ourselves or our families and friends. And while most of these might seem like trivial details, they actually give students a sense of who we are as people and allow us to be more approachable and, when we can, and we can also invite students to do the same thing. We must also be mindful about the language that appears in our course syllabi as it sets the tone for the relationships that will be established between us and our students. Language that is rigid and punitive and suggests to students that we do not believe in them or we don't trust them or we're not invested in their success is not helpful. The language in our syllabus should reflect a tone that is both validating and empowering. Next, we must be culturally relevant and affirming. Being culturally relevant and affirming draws from the work of Dr. Gloria Latson billings and other scholars who've made important contributions to knowledge in this area. Scholars who study culturally relevant teaching also contend that it is important to center diverse students in every aspect of the course, the curriculum, the selective readings and texts, guest speakers, and even assessment, to name a few. But we can also do things like acknowledge the intellectual contributions of people of color in the field. So for example, Gladys Mae West, the black mathematician whose work has contributed to the development of global positioning systems. Or Victor Newman Lauda, who is a Latino mathematician. Or Ellen Ochoa, an aerospace engineer who in 1993 became the first Latina to travel to space. And then there's Susan Picotti, who was, a native, who was Native American and made important contributions to medicine, to name some. We must be very intentional in helping, also be very intentional in helping students make connections between the content we're teaching and the issues and experiences and challenges that are present in their daily lives. But above all, when you take the time to affirm students' identities in the classroom, it lets them know that you not only care about their learning, but you also value who they are as people and their lived experiences. Fourth, we must be equity-centered. And we must be equity-centered in our teaching, and our learning, and all the support that we offer students. But what exactly does that look like in the context of teaching and learning? One, we have a course that's rooted in an ethos that prioritizes community and collaboration as opposed to competitiveness. Students and instructors have the opportunities to be both teachers and learners. A range of strategies are used to assess student learning. A range of pedagogies are used uh, to teach. And relationship building and intrusivity and validation and humanizing practices and race consciousness are all embedded in the course. We also make sure that course policies related to grading and attendance and participation and any required texts how assignments are submitted do not further disadvantage disproportionately impacted students. These are just a few examples. Being equity centered in the context of teaching and learning also means paying very close attention to digital equity. The pandemic was a jolting reminder of how much the digital divide has continued to widen, even as our society has become more reliant on technology to communicate and take care of our daily routines and activities. Digital equity is not just about making sure that every student has a device that would allow them to access the course or the campus, but it also means making sure that every student has the technology they need, technological knowledge they need, to connect and engage seamlessly and to make meaningful contributions within virtual learning spaces. And this will require some scaffolding, particularly for students who may have been away from higher education or formal learning for long periods of time. Next, we must be race conscious. Recall from our earlier conversation about equity and equity-mindedness that being race conscious is 
a core aspect of being equity-minded. And one of the most important ways we can be race conscious in our work with students is to recognize how educational access and opportunities in the United States has always been stratified by race, both historically and contemporarily. So for example, we know that in, our K in the K-12 context, schools that serve predominantly white and affluent families tend to have the most experienced and credentialed teachers, have access to the most rigorous curricula, have the most up-to-date facilities, and provide students with transformational learning experiences like internships and field trips abroad. So in some ways, community colleges play an essential role in closing the opportunity gap between racially minoritized students and their white peers. Yet at the same time, Tata Yoso's community cultural wealth theory helps us recognize the invaluable cultural wealth that is often recognized, unrecognized by educators, like aspirational capital, which describes communities of color's abilities to always be hopeful and to envision positive futures for themselves and their families, despite being consistently challenged by systemic oppression. And familial capital, which is the, um, which is the cultural bonds, and histories, and knowledge, and the traditions that are passed down across generations. And resistant capital, which captures communities of color's courage and resilience to resist, system, to resist racism and patriarchy and other forms of oppression in ways that enable them to sustain the core of who they are. The question for us is how do we intentionally design experiences for students that enable them to recognize their cultural wealth, um, the cultural wealth that they possess, but also leverage it in ways that can facilitate their success in education and beyond. This is what it means to be race conscious. We also have to be responsive. And we, know, we all know what it means to be responsive and can all recall times and frustrations, times of frustration when someone we really needed, someone uh, we really need did not provide a timely response to our concern. And one of the key lessons we've learned from our work with community colleges over the years is that students see an instructor or even an institution's responsiveness as a measure of their own value and self-worth within that institution. I know all of us are working very hard to manage so many demands of our time and attention. That said, we must be sure to prioritize our students by responding to their needs and concerns in the most timely manner possible. Be clear with students about how to best connect with you and by when they should expect a response or to know that you're available. Now, this does not mean that you need to have a 24-7 open-door policy. That's not desirable nor realistic. But it does mean that when a student contacts you, try your very best to respond within 24 hours, and maybe sooner on the days leading up to an exam or the due date for a major assignment. Uh, there's all sorts of tools and resources that are available to us, like GQs and email templates and filters that can help automate responses to inquiries that come up often. And I'm sure that there are some emerging technologies as well. But no matter what, let's try to be as personal and humanistic as possible responding to students and their concerns. Our next strategy is to be validated. Of course, we know that the concept of validation in education comes from the work of Dr. Laura Rendon while she was a professor at Cal State University, Long Beach. Validation theory is now one of the most widely applied theories in student success research and practice. And according to Rendon, non-traditional students need validation which is defined as an enabling, confirming, and supportive process initiated by in and out of, uh, initiated by in and out of class agents that foster academic and interpersonal development. Validating agents are faculty and staff and other individuals in a student's life who provides much needed encouragement, support, and access to resources and information. We know that many of our students who've been disproportionately impacted in education have been led to believe that they are not, quote, college material. Thus helping students recognize that they are smart and fully capable and can achieve their academic career and life goals is a gift that keeps on giving in education. And I can think of so many times when I personally have benefited from validation from an educator or an advisor and other key folks in my educational journey. Validation can help counter much needed self-doubt and insecurity 
that, a subtle, that has a subtle yet profound impact on a student's confidence and ultimately their success. And we know that validation is incredibly important during times of uncertainty, when students are questioning if they should be in school rather than working more or doing something else. And with all the negative rhetoric about the value of education that is dominating our national headlines today, we need to be very intentional in validating our students, both in terms of what they're capable of achieving and in terms of their decision to enroll in the State Center Community College District. Next, let's be empowering. One of the most important things we can do as educators is to empower students. Being empowering essentially means helping students discover their gifts and their talents as learners, discovering their voices, and helping them use both to impact their families and communities in positive ways. When students are empowered, they take on greater ownership and responsibility for their learning and are much more likely to embrace an internal locus of control. When they do well, they are likely to attribute their success to factors that were fully within their control, like their study habits and their preparation as examples, rather than externalizing their success by suggesting that they got lucky or that the professor may took it out easy on them. But this also means that students are much more likely to take ownership when things don't go as well as they hoped or expected. They may say, hey, I need to plan or prepare better, or something to that effect. Empowered students are also willing to reach out for support when they need it and utilize it and utilize the resources that are afforded to them because they believe they deserve them. So a big takeaway from this strategy is to consistently remind students that they have something to contribute to everyone's learning experience and that both their presence and their perspectives are valued. Remind them of this when you talk to them. Leave notes when you give them feedback on their assignments and try to end every interaction you have with them with something empowering to say. Next, it's important for us to be learner-centered in our teaching. So for example, most community college students are adult learners, which means that they're more likely than not to be attending part-time, working full-time, and have significant life experiences and responsibilities that compete for their time and attention. Now, this does not mean that they're not committed to their studies, or that they don't appreciate the opportunity to study with you. But it does mean that we have to design a learning experience that takes this into account into the lived experiences of adult learners. Malcolm Knowles' Principles of Adult Learning provide some good guidance on how we can do this. And Knowles tells us that experience is an adult learner's greatest learning resource. Thus, we must find ways for adult learners to leverage their lived experiences in ways that facilitate their learning. And we also know that adult learners respond better to intrinsic motivators, like having a genuine interest in the content or self-satisfaction that they do to extrinsic motivators, like grades and other, other extrinsic rewards. And finally, we need to ask ourselves, how can we assess student learning in ways that are aligned with their learning strengths? So for example, some students may be better able to demonstrate their learning in a written paper uh, or oral presentation than they can on a multiple choice exam. And so being learner-centered means that, that utilizing a range of strategies to assess student learning rather than only relying on one or a few. Now this last strategy is for you. It's important for us to be kind to ourselves by practicing what my colleague and friend and brother Dr. J. Luke Wood and I call radical self-care. Most of us come from generations where working nonstop until you drop was the norm. But these past three years have shown us that we can ill afford to continue to do that. This means that we must take the time we need to rest and recover and to prioritize things that sustain us and allow us to show up as our best selves. Exercising regularly, eating, eating a good healthy diet, starting your day with a prayer or a meditation, or taking the time you need to stay connected with family and friends and taking vacations all examples of things that we can do to prioritize our health and our wellness and our self-care. And when we practice good self-care, it allows us to think more clearly and to manage the day-to-day -day stressors and pressures that come with being a professional educator in the present context. And for those of you who are managers, making sure you, you model self-care for the colleagues you supervise and encouraging them to take care of themselves is also important. 
and in your one-on-ones asking them, what are they doing to prioritize their self-care? And so with that, I want to say thank you. I want to wish everyone a very, very successful 2023-2024 uh, academic year. Uh, again, it is always a pleasure to be with colleagues at the State Center Community College District, and I hope to get the opportunity to engage with you again soon. Thank you so much.